Word, I got a little message hey, for the, the listeners out here in regards to, to colleges and things to look out for for the new millennials. Okay, okay. So today, uh, uh, today, you know, today being the second day of, you know what I'm saying, the holiday that we celebrate called Kwanzaa, um, and today, you know, like I said, it's my favorite day, you know, we call Kuju Tagalia. Uh, which means self-determination. Um, you know, Kujichagalia means for us to define ourselves, name ourselves, create for ourselves, and speak for ourselves. Uh, Kujichagalia demands that we as a melanated people define, defend, and develop ourselves instead of allowing, other, allowing or encouraging others to do this. It requires that we recover lost memory and once again shape our world in our own image and interest. And it's a call to recover and speak our own truth to the world and raise images above the earth that reflect our capacity for human greatness and progress. Um, I feel that Kujichagalia is something that's so powerful, and um, one of the reasons why I harp on it every day is actually one of the reasons that led me to go into media. Because you know, when you look at uh, when you look at any type of urban network, or when you listen to any type of urban network that's um, on the on the, the radio waves that our people listen to you're hearing a lot of negative content. And I think a lot of people do not realize how that negative content plays into our, um, our, our psyche, you know, um, our, what they call our subliminal consciousness, you know, the things that you see and things that you hear. Um, like, you know, I just think about the um, other day. And so, you know, that's the reason why we need networks like the Bridge of Light, you know what I'm saying, radio to continuously bring um, not only new voices in the community, but also um, change the perception that we have of ourselves. And that's, you know, one thing that, that Ms. E has started right here, you know, to where we can create a network to where we can speak about our issues in our own manner. Not only talk about our own issues, but give our own interpretation of that. So, Mr. Orlando, man, tell me, tell me what Kuju Chagalia means to you, brother. Man, what it means, what it means to me is, man, pretty much just, you know, understanding the, you know, the, the, you know, to put it blank, pretty much just the knowledge of self. And that's something that, that's something that's not really taught in the household, per se. That's something that's not really focused on in school. And that seems like that's kind of like, like your own independent journey that you have to indulge in on your own. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, for the things that I've, that I've been through, the knowledge of self, self, you know, pretty much branches the, the sense of being or the sense of purpose. So, you know, entering into the year of 2018, my sense of purpose is to be able to spread more more knowledge, to, uh, to live a more humble and a more focused lifestyle than I did last year. And that's just my form of elevation and growth. Mm, most definitely. Most def. I know for me, um, going forward, I definitely want to make sure that I'm investing as much time into myself and my family as I am into, you know, my community and my business initiatives. Um, because, you know, I realize the the power of family. Uh, my, you know, saying my children, my, my children, my wife, you know, what I'm saying that's the specific legacy that I'm gonna leave on this planet. And you know, I think that that will mean more than any company I create or you know any type of music I create or podcasts or anything else like that. So um, I definitely want to continuously try to um, master self so that I can practice self-discipline so that I'll be able to do a lot of the things I say I want to do. Uh, because, you know, just me personally, I can definitely say that um, one of the reasons why a lot of things that I want to happen do not manifest is because um, I lack self-discipline in certain areas of my life. And so, you know, in those areas, I'm definitely looking to improve on that. Um, so, uh, with that being said, I also want our people to understand what is power. You know, mm -hmm. How can we take back power of self? Um, you know, I always throw out the way Noble's quote, where the essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and make them live according to their definition as though it was a definition of their own choosing. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times we end up making choices thinking that we have the power but we don't necessarily you know what I'm saying we're given to like when they say the election choose the lesser to evil you know what I'm saying <laughs> like you know I feel that that's a lot of areas of our life but with that being said there are a lot of things coming around in this new new age uh, from um, the 
opportunities on social media for people to create their platforms from uh, like we were building early on the cryptocurrency rush that's going right, on today right, right. Uh, for our generation to really build wealth, you know what I'm saying, for our families. Exactly. Um, man, have, you, have you gotten into the crypto yet? Uh, not, not the crypto. You, uh, you like me <laughs> up on some positive information, but I right now I'm currently doing traditional stocks. You know, I got some stocks in, in my company. You know, if you're gonna work for if you're gonna work for somebody, might as well reap the benefit from the company by investing in some stocks. You know, a couple of Nike stocks, a couple of stocks in, in Snapchat. You know, good, bad, right, or wrong. It's better to put your pie into something because if you don't participate, you're gonna always lose anyway. Right, right, right. And um, you know, a lot of people have been asking me questions about cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and um, everything that's going on. Uh, I think you know, definitely, there's a lot of skepticism out there. Uh, which you which you understand, uh, just because sim simply a lot of people don't invest. Um, but you know, with any investment, you don't risk more than you're willing to lose, and so no investment is guaranteed. But you know, you you do have to take a chance um, with to try to make your money make money because otherwise it's just going to be sitting in a, in a bank and you know not collecting. You also have a certain rate of interest, so. You know, with anything, you know, do your research, do your due diligence, and, um, you know, just as it relates to the cryptocurrency, um, yeah, Bitcoin has been moving, moving crazy, you know what I'm saying, moving heavy. It's moving heavy. Yeah, moving heavy, heavy, heavy. heavy. Uh, but definitely the people that are seeing the rewards of Bitcoin are those that were able to get in in 2009, 2010, you know, the people that may have bought at $10, $100, and, you know, now... Now they're, you know, saying seeing crazy prices. And, you know, even recently, you know, we saw the price drop. And, you know, some people say, oh, Bitcoin crashed. It went down, you know, they're not down to 10, 11,000. But if you got in at $100, you're not really losing. And, you know, when you look at it, it's still up like 1,000% on the year. But um, for me, um, I've been looking into um, what they call altcoins and tokens, um, you know, essentially looking for the next Bitcoin. Um, the next opportunity to invest because you know that's the way you see that the world is going you know what I'm saying you see the world is going towards moving the power out of the hands of institutions right, right. you know what I'm saying with like everything you know what I'm saying like whether it's retail um, whether it's transportation whether it's finance and you know you just like after you you kind of see the wheel go around long enough you kind of see the same thing said over and over and over again you know just like when uh, when eBay first came out they said well you can't trust somebody that you don't know to send them money and they're gonna send you the product that you actually want like you you know you can't trust that that's not gonna work <laughs> you know that you can't trust the green sheets of Craigslist like that's not gonna work same way with Uber you know it was like. You know, the yellow cabs and everything was established, but you can't trust somebody to use their car, be on time, come pick you up, take you where you need to go, and you're going to be safe. Don't trust that. Then now you're here. The same thing, you know what I'm saying, with the crypto. Oh, you can't, what is it backed by? What is it, what is it tracked by? You know what I'm saying? All those different things. Well, and I do agree that there's a lot that still needs to be worked out. Um, and I think that that will come with time and technology, but. Anybody that asks you what is cryptocurrency backed by, by ask them what is the dollar backed by. You know, also want to add on to that. You know, when we speak about that, you know, you know, as you said before, you know, nothing is really guaranteed. And one thing that you want to be mindful of is, you know, you know, every black family has that that auntie, that grandma that loves to go to the casino, loves to go gamble, loves to play the slot machine, loves to go try to play <laughs> the millions. And you know, the way I play the stock market is, you know. I invest at least three hundred dollars a year. You know, you can you, the average person will will bet three hundred dollars at a casino, and they know that I'm not going to spend over that three hundred dollar limit. This right. is all I'm going to bring. This is all I'm going to take. Once I cap out, that's it. Stock market the same way. You know, you don't want you don't spend more than what you're willing to lose. So, if you you know, that's my form of playing. You know, gambling is playing the stock market because that same money that I put into these different businesses, that's my form of investments. My investments are saving up for a rainy day, and that's something that we have to think about. And you know, it's you know, it's kind of funny because you know, other races or different groups of people, they already know the game. It's just something that we see as taboo because we weren't taught to look at it that way. But everybody's playing the game, so. 
you know, if they're not afraid to play it, we definitely should be afraid, afraid to play it. Mm, absolutely, man. Time, time to get in, you know what I'm saying? 2018, you know, it's time, time to get in. Man, brother, you've been, uh, you been following the, the situation with Brother Omar, man? Yeah, I, I, I've been, you know, I tap into a little bit, you know, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, the whole issue is, you know, you know, they're trying to take away his credentials. Well, yeah, I, I know he's been he's been called for a review uh, of, uh, of yeah his credentials and his, his ability to practice um, psychology in the state of uh, Pennsylvania, I believe. And uh, you know, we definitely wish the brother, you know, what I'm saying the best, you know, what I'm saying with this case. Uh, you know, I, I would I would definitely would not like to see you know what I'm saying anything happen to the brother. Uh, you know, what I'm saying as far as uh, some some other things, uh, I, I think you know, what I'm saying I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave off the air. You know, what I'm saying we'll, we'll probably uh, talk about that. You know, what I'm saying amongst family. Uh, you know, because brother Umar is definitely coming into Houston. Um, I believe on the thirtieth. Um, but yeah, man, it's 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 been crazy though. You know, what I'm saying just seeing how uh, polarizing. You know, what I'm saying his name even is. You know, what I'm saying when, when it's mentioned. And I think that, you know, regardless of how you feel about the Umar situation, I think it's something that we all should definitely think about as we move through, you know what I'm saying, this so-called conscious community or, you know what I'm saying, the community in general, and what type of um, perception and image, you know what I'm saying, do you want to have amongst your own people? Uh, you know, I, I know that with our people, um, you know, we're going through a lot, so... Um, you know, historically, there hasn't really been a, um, a so-called black leader that has stood up and that has been widely accepted. And, you know, um, when you really look at our generation, I think our generation is moving away from that formal leader and that formal head. And they're just kind of like, everybody needs to do for something. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We don't need somebody to follow. And so I believe that, you know, when there is that individual that tries to take on that role um, I think that we're going to consistently end up in this hamster wheel, you know what I'm saying, uh, of debates and arguing and everything else like that, man. So um, I, I definitely salute, you know what I'm saying, all of the organizations that are out here in Houston putting in work um, from Inbub to No Land Men of Action to the Blacklist, um, you know, uh, Houston Unity Tribe. Um, you know, I definitely love the way that all of those organizations move. And you know that's the model that you kind of see today. Yeah. Also, you know, um, in regards to Dr. Umar, you know, you know, me personally, you know, I don't have any, you know, ill will or, or doubts about the things that he does. You know, personally, you know, I don't agree with everything that he does, but we also don't want to forget that he's only human. Absolutely. And sometimes we get beside ourselves, be like, oh, he's supposed to do this. Hey, he's supposed to do that. But he's just a human being, just like anybody else. And people. You know, make mistakes. You know, people fall short. You know, even if you look at it from a religious standpoint, you know, falling before the glory of God, if you will. Mm -hmm. But the same energy that you want to put towards forgiving your oppressor, you know, you got to kind of look back at your at your brother Umar and be like, hey, you know, he is looking out for the children. He's always been about the people. He he's always been about the message. Right. You no, know, no different than how Malcolm X was viewed back in the day. Because you know, when I was growing up in the history books, he was he was looked upon as a tyrant compared to Martin Luther King. All right. The the same demonization that the same demonization and real ridicule ridicule that Marcus Garvey or Malcolm X or Nat Turner received, you know, Umar Johnson is a too too different from from those same avenues. So we, you want to be. Be wary of the the mind tricks and the deception that people will try to wage war. Each, you know, just even between us, because I will say this: you know, no matter how demonic people may think Donald Trump is, people still support him. People still people will rally around him, no matter what, and they will still carry on his agenda. So I just say that to say this: you know, just don't lose sight. Facts, facts, facts. Well, we're finna get into a quick break. And uh, we'll be back on the Bridge of Light Radio, Melanated Illuminated Takeover, baby. You are listening to the Bridge. Share your opinion by calling 713-789-2096. Say you Oh, on which, on which one do you want? The Melanated Network? No, the one you're writing. Oh, I'm, 
I just now got about, about three pages in. Okay. So I just started just so this year for uh, the, the topics. You know, I, I kind of got the little bit on paper, but you know, everything is you know, in my head's got to be transferred into it. Okay. Okay. And then, um, hey, can you come back? Uh, I guess that time I could return to it. Melanated, illuminated takeover of the Bridge of Light Radio. We are here. You know what I'm saying? If you want to talk to us, you can give us a call at 713-789-0096. Um, you know, just, you know, highlight us, you know, call us, talk about anything. Um, but, you know, today we are here um, on this beautiful day of Kuchi Chagalia, um, self-determination uh, for our people, you know what I'm saying, to learn to define ourselves, name ourselves, create for ourselves, and speak for ourselves. Um, the power in the tongue, the power of the image that we create for ourselves, the power of the image that we create for ourselves for our children, and how important that tent it is to carry, um, not only during these days um, of the holidays that we call Kwanzaa, but 365, 24-7, um, 365. Um, Kujagalia is something that every black man and woman should live every day because our kids are watching and you know i'm particularly um, you know uh, sometimes I, I get i get a little flat because uh, uh i don't i don't speak a lot to the women per se you know what I'm saying just because i i feel that it's hard for me as a man to tell a woman what she should be doing as a woman but i stay on the black man you know what I'm saying? because <laughs> i'm a black man and I, uh, I'm not the perfect black man, but, you know what I'm saying, I've, I've been around elders, you know what I'm saying, I've, I've had examples, you know what I'm saying, to look at and, and, and live by. And so, um, I'm always staying on the black man, just because I feel that it's our duty, you know what I'm saying, to carry the community to the next level. You know what I'm saying, regardless of anything else that's going on, regardless of you know what I'm saying, the different beefs that's created, you know what I'm saying, that we know systematically uh, by the government and everything else like that that's going on. I feel that it's our responsibility to uh, lead our families, lead our communities to, you know what I'm saying, the next level. So Orlando, man, I want to ask you um, on this day of Kuchi Chagalia, um, what woke you up? And, you know, I think that's a general question, but what led you to start the path of knowledge yourself? Oh man, you kind of put me in a hot seat with this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> man, no one kind of kind of take a little bit, little bit back on this yeah, one. Yeah, man, you know why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would say to to keep the long story short, what what got me, what got those gears going was my my first year of college, and you know I got around a group of dudes, you know. You know, a group of friends, matter of fact, because we still communicate to this day about higher conscious. But, you know, we were talking about, you know, religion and what it means to be on this earth and really just your sense of purpose. And, you know, just like any traditional black family, you know, we grew up in the Christian household. You know, we were taught what to believe and how to conform in that particular dominate denomination that, that you affiliate with and that was pretty much it. We weren't really taught to answer, to ask questions. And, you know, one of the questions that I've always had for myself is, you know, why why am I black? You know, you know, out of different races, you know, why is my hair a different texture? Why is my why why does my skin get darker when I when the sun hits my skin and 
why am I treated differently in the world? So, you know, the, the Bible will, will say that black people are cursed. I, I don't I don't believe that. Because, you know, when you start reading different types of books with slavery archives and what slave masters wrote, they specifically said that they used the Bible as a tool or a weapon to suppress black people. So, you know, that just opened up a can of worms within itself to for me to dig a little bit deeper. Then you start digging into who Jesus was, you know, who, you know, you start talking about the Catholic Church, and you start going further and further and further until you start getting into the inventions and the history. you like, wait, hold up, you know. <laughs> we're, we're, we're more special than what the world gives us credit for. So once I start quit focusing on the religious side it's just, and start focusing on the ancestors. And, you know, one of the, one of the biggest questions that, I, that still kind of puzzles me to this day that most of the world's inventions were being created during the slavery period. And when you look at what it means to be a black man or a black woman in slavery, you think about, well, man, you couldn't read, you couldn't write, you couldn't properly be married. Your, your children was all was always sold, but these these black men and strong black women they had the ability to invent, even though they couldn't speak the conqueror's language. So what always puzzled me was well, what kind of divine being allowed our ancestors to be able to invent and create in those type of conditions. Absolutely. That that that's something that no other race could do. Even being born on the slave ship and being brought here, no other race could work in the sun or, you know, sun up to sun down for numerous hours to still survive those conditions. So, you know, that giving me a, a huge respect for where we come from. Absolutely. And, and I think that that's, you know, one of the reasons, just bringing it back to Kuja Chagulia and why, um, you know, as I as I got older, uh, you know, like, like a lot of young people, you know, you kind of start reading facts and everything like that. Um, you can you can feel a little betrayed, you know, what I'm saying as it relates to religion and a lot of things like that, because you feel that there was a lot of history, you know, what I'm saying and, and a lot of truth that was hidden from you. And so, you know, um, you know, I, I'm one of the, you know, saying the hardest critics, you know, saying on, you know, what I'm saying the Bible, the Quran, you know, what I'm saying all those different things. But the more that you learn, you know, what I'm saying the more that you see that, you know, what I'm saying all of those original texts were written, you know, what I'm saying by our people, you know, what I'm saying whether it's the Bible, the Quran, or whatever. But what others did was they came and they took and that they added their interpretation, you know, what I'm saying right. on. Um, ancient texts, and that's the reason, you know what I'm saying, you come out with things like, you know what I'm saying, the interpretation that black, black people are cursed, and you know what I'm saying, everything else like that, you know, when, when you allow others to make those connections for you, and then give it to you, um, you know, that kind of kind of led to, you know, the predicament of, of our understanding, and then, you know, as we grew, you know what I'm saying, in our understanding, we were able to define it ourselves. I mean, even when you look at the, um, the Baptist church, and when you look at how how the church service is carried out, that right there in itself, you know what I'm saying? Some people don't like it when I say it, but that in itself still has an African feel to it. Because think about it, all the different denominations of Christianity, ain't no church do service like a Baptist church. You know what I'm saying? Like from, from the music to the preacher, everything else like that. Um, you know, for when you talk about the cadence of the, the preacher, like I said, the music and everything else like that. And that right there shows how brilliant our ancestors were because, yes, even though they had to practice, you know what I'm saying, this certain version of Christianity, they still were able to, to, to lay down little, what I call breadcrumbs, you know what I'm saying, under the religion for us that eventually would lead back to where we are today, to where us eventually, you know what I'm saying, Bringing, bringing the cipher around and making the connection to, you know what I'm saying, where it actually came from. And you actually brought up a great point, too, on, um, you know, one thing I say uh, with, with everything that's go that goes on with black people, the fact that we're still here today and we're still inventing shows our divine nature, you know, because there have been um, strands of the, human genome that have went through less than what black people have went through. Um, when you're talking about from 
uh, the transatlantic slave trade, from the um, the brutal breeding practices that they made people go through, from the psychological warfare, from the fact of that, you know what I'm saying, but we ate scraps um, for the longest, and we still are here today, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> we're still here, I mean, they gave us pig butt, and we made it a delicacy, you know what I'm saying, like, that's just what we do, whatever it is, you know what I'm saying, the scraps, we go take it, we go piece it together, and we're going to make something new, and then they're going to start copying it, you know what I'm saying, like, they invented it. And that's the same thing that you see with the religions, you know what I'm saying, like, all of that stuff um, has an African origin. Because, like, when you look at all the names and all the texts, you know what I'm saying, like, there's no Europe in the Bible, you know what I'm saying, like, at all. Like, there's no China, there's no Asia, you know what I'm saying, now they call it the so-called Middle East, but... It's all Africa. There's no North America, South America, none of that in there. And yeah, man. You know what? Um, that's a very interesting point because you know when you think about not only how, you know how the you know church pretty much pulled different things that we have done and and implemented into their traditions. You know, even other races of people does the exact same thing. And it's a, a saying that I kind of believe. You know, you can agree or disagree is that you know the black man the black woman they create you know the the asian or oriental they actually reconstruct because you know traditionally asians they were known for for reverse engineering and tearing things apart and rebuilding it and you know our white counterparts they usually just steal and re <laughs> redistribute them. and that's just kind of like a cultural phenomenon that we kind of see but you know every every group has their own expertise and we've always been the masters of teachers and inventors because people watch what we do just to see what's trending. Absolutely. And, you know, and then this is the reason why we have to practice Kujitagami in the music industry because, you know, they understand the power of vibrations and the powers of words and the power of, you know what I'm saying, the different things that you put out there and how it comes back around. And definitely, you know what I'm saying, with that being said, you know, they're using they're using our music as a weapon against it. You know what I'm saying? They're using our the music to that's the reason why you can't have poor righteous teachers. You can't have arrested development or or any any type of artist, you know what I'm saying, um, talking about history, telling the truth, you know what I'm saying, going against the system or anything else like that. You have to have, you know what I'm saying, the booty shaking, getting high, the sex, the drugs, um, so that people don't utilize their vibrations to, you know what I'm saying, elevate, you know what I'm saying, to those high, higher chakras. Um, and, you know, those those vibrations are keep, are keeping us, you know what I'm saying, at a low vibration. Mm -hmm. And we don't even realize it, you know what I'm saying? Like, and it's crazy, you know what I'm saying, like, like no diss, like, man, I love Zero, you know what I'm saying? Like, psh, it's like one of my favorite rappers, like, like, you know what I'm saying? Just one of my favorite rappers. And like I said, I love him, man. And you know, it was like the other day, I'm listening, I'm driving, you know what I'm saying? I'm listening to him. CDs, I always listen to. And I'm bumping it. And like, I'm just like, all of a sudden, just start like, like feeling like angry. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, just like pumped up, you know what I'm saying? Inside, like, and I don't even know why, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, like, man, I flipped it off and I turned back to NPR and like, you know what I'm saying? Like, the, the feeling went away, but like, it was just crazy, you know what I'm saying? Like, once you become aware, you know what I'm saying? You're actually able to feel your body, you know what I'm saying? Like, changing and like, what's going on? I was like, for a minute, for a few minutes, I was like, man, this ain't me. Like, it was, it was like, really like, taking over me. Like, man, that's crazy, bro. Right. Man, he's speaking the truth. He's speaking the truth. You know, I, you know, I have to, you know, live that straight and narrow force, the music that I listen to because, you know, you know, the hip hop that I once grew up in is not quite the same that we listen to today. You know, that's not to discredit, you know, different the you know, the new artist that comes out to each his own, but the message is is what's missing for me. And it's hard to digest any of the information we don't even understand what the rapper or singer is talking about. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then me personally, I, I don't really come down hard on the artist. Uh, just because once you understand the system of what's going on, um, the artists are, are are part of it, but they aren't the main culprits. Because I mean, when you think about it, like most of the artists, you know, under twenty five, like no one under twenty five owns a radio station. 
Nobody under 25 owns a record label. So, you know, you got these 50-year-old Jewish white men that are pushing this music out to young black people. And nobody questions what is their intent. You know what I'm saying? Like, why do you have these 50-year-old people that are removed from the culture? You know what I'm saying? Like, not to say that, you know what I'm saying, like, you can't be of a certain age and still connect to the youth. But I mean, when we're talking about people not of the culture, you know what I'm saying, and from a different generation that are feeding information, you know what I'm saying, to a different generation to get them to act how they act. Like, nobody really, like I said, as much as we go in on the artists, you know what I'm saying, and, and like, nobody goes in on the, these record executives, nobody goes in on these people running Clearwater and all these other, you know what I'm saying, radio stations about what's their specific agenda that they have for putting this type of music out there, because you can't say that there aren't artists out there that make good music. Right. You can't say that there aren't artists that out there that make music that make people feel good. You know what I'm saying? And that aren't only talking about drugs or anything else like that. But for whatever reason, you have these guys that choose to only allow this specific section of music. You know what I'm saying? And, and I think that's the main thing that has changed. I don't think that the content has changed. Because, you know, we always had two live crew and everything else like that, but I think that at one, you had the variety from two live crew to outcast mm -hmm. that you can hear on, on any given day, when now it's just, you know what I'm saying, booty, 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 you know that, everything else like that. Man. Well, we know, I, I, you know, on top of that, not, I, not, I won't only say the executives, but, you know, hip hop just allowing anybody into the culture. You know, look at, oh. you know, you got your, your Molly Cyrus's, Mm. Your, your, your Justin Bieber's, right. you got your your Katy Perry's, yeah. Justin Timberlake's, right. Robin Thicke. Hey man, I think that that's hey man, I think that's something like yeah, a lot of people are not gonna write man, but yeah, I think that's one problem that we got as a people. You know what I'm saying? And, and not being exclusive with our um, with our content, right? We don't no no, no not being exclusive with our culture. You know what I'm saying? Like we shouldn't allow people from outside our culture to have any say so within the culture. And but you know we got you know we we we, we the people of the earth so you know what I'm saying we got such good hearts we got such big hearts you know what I'm saying we can't say no you know what I'm saying and, and I think that that's that's killing us hey, I, you know no no doubt you know when you look at different genres of music you know when the last time you seen a black country singer mm. you you know I haven't seen you know since Hootie and the Blowfish I guess and for <laughs> the longest I didn't even know that the lead one lead singer was <laughs> I, I never knew. <laughs> Yeah. But you see how they kind of kept him in the closet. Right, right, right. And then right. when you dig a little bit further, he was like the honorary black dude at that. Right, right, Even right. when you listen to uh, Tejano or Mexican music, black people aren't integrated into that. We listen to uh, K-pop with that, with the Asians and Koreans, black people aren't migrated into that. Yeah, they may exploit our style or, right. you know, our little cadences of how we speak. They may implement it, but... We're not allowed to be guests in other genres of music like how everybody embraces. Nobody hip -hop. is. Nobody is. No. No other culture or genre has somebody not of the culture that they would consider top. You know what I'm saying? Like, and you know, me and my bro brothers, we always argue about Eminem. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it, it ain't just the fact that he's white. You know what I'm saying? It's the fact of, of the the content. You know what I'm saying? The content that he spits isn't relevant to the culture. You know what I'm saying? Like, can you just imagine um, a black man making songs about raping his mom or killing his girlfriend and throwing her in the trunk? You know what I'm saying? Like, if he ran out of town, like, <laughs> no way, no way. You know what I'm saying? But you know, then he can make that type of music, and people will say, oh, you know, what I'm saying he's the greatest or whatever. And I'm like, Psst, get out of here. You know what, <laughs> what I'm saying? Like, because like you said, as, as great as Dr. Dre and Kanye are as beat producers like if they went to Tejano they could make great music but nobody would consider them the greatest right, like, right. at all you know what I'm saying just because they not of the culture mm -hmm. like but you know that's that's our problem you know what I'm saying why we stay getting with but you know what I'm saying enough of that man um yeah. oh man oh man we getting we getting we getting shout outs man oh it's not we got the people on the screen what up man what up what up cuz <laughs> my wig cuz she Oh man, checking us out, man. Yeah, man, give us a call, man. 713 789 0096. We up here, man. Orlando, bro. 
you working on the book, man. You know what I'm oh, saying? Man, like, I, I couldn't wait to touch this topic. Like, like, once again, man, that's why, I, you know what I'm saying, like, when people see me, um, you know, we, we, we good? We need to take another break? We need to take another break. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, man, we're going um, we gonna, to gonna take another break. We're going to get in, man. I'm going to let my boy Orlando, you know what I'm saying, build on this book, you know what I'm saying, that he got coming up, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Young black artists, you know what I'm saying, making, making it work. You know what I'm saying? Watch out, we're gonna be back on the Bridge of Light Radio. Melanated Illuminated Takeover, baby. You are listening to The Bridge. Share your opinion by calling 713-789-0096. Stay tuned. Yeah. Oh man, that's a good time. Hey man, yeah, we, we, can, we, can, we can go in, man, because like I said, I did music, and that's the one thing like you never hear, like I said, we always talk about the artists, but we never go at you know, then the people that's owning these stations, and we never just ask the questions. Or like I said, what are these, what are these old white Jewish dudes' agenda with? Well, you know, they should know all the black. Roland Martin, uh, right. What's his name? Uh, right, right. Time smiling. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. They, they, they got to. And and yeah. And like I said, we got these people feeding our babies. You know, what I'm saying this garbage. Yeah. And. We will, like I said, we'll be quick to attack the artists, and I think that's just kind of one of those things, once again. Uh, and, and one thing, like, why, you know what I'm saying, I mean, we still alive, but that's the, that's the family, I ain't tripping. But, um, you know what I'm saying, with the whole Umar thing, like, you know what I'm saying, I got, I got more to say, but, you know what I'm saying, like, um, I, I'm not going to be the one that, even, even with the issues I have, um, you know what I'm saying? Only be prepared to ride down on another black person. Like regardless, right, you know right. what I'm saying? Yes. You know, we not we not riding down on white people or anybody else, right. you know what I'm saying, that we deem my enemy like that. Like I so said, we ready we always ready to go to war with each other, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, versus you know, try to, you know, embrace and try right. to work things out. Same thing with the whole LeVar Ball situation, right. different things like that. Uh oh. Yeah, because he turned it up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, man. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Boogie and Cutter, dropping jewels. Man, we back with the Melanated Illuminated Takeover of the Bridge of Light Radio Network here, broadcasting live in Houston, Texas. Um, Man, I just, um, you know, I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, everybody that follows me, that listens to me, that supports me, I want to say thank you. Um, you know what I'm saying? I, there's, no, there's no me without you. And I want to make sure that you all support this wonderful radio network, the Bridge of Light uh, Radio. Um, you know what I'm saying? Miss E, you know what I'm saying? A strong black woman, you know what I'm saying? Out here putting it down. Uh, for the for the culture, and you know also you know uh, one thing that I always love about her is she always giving you know what I'm saying opportunities to the next generation, um, and you know with with that being said you know what I'm saying she still will keep you in line, she still is not having no mess, but at the same time um, um, having having elders like that around you not only pushes you to be greater but you know what I'm saying it also keep you on your square because you know that you can't just you can't just come around. Um, certain elders, you know what I'm saying, talking a certain way, acting a certain way, and, you know, that translates from, you know, that 30 minutes or that hour interaction to, you know what I'm saying, the, the remaining, you know, 24 hours of your life. Um, so, before we left, man, we, we was building with my boy Orlando, man, you got a, you got a new book that you're working on, man, um, and, you know what I'm saying, that, first let me say, man, I'm, I'm happy and I'm proud of you, man, like, I mean, appreciate um, you, appreciate you, you know, one, one thing, you know what I'm saying, that's another thing about me, you know what I'm saying, people see me and they think I'm smart or knowledgeable or whatever, but, you know, the only reason that I am is because we are, you know what I'm saying, I keep a uh, nice group of brothers around me that consistently inspires me to be greater and do better, you know what I'm saying, well, well, oh, you know what I'm saying, he a few years younger than me, you know what I'm saying, and he already working on his first publication, and you know what I'm saying, I think that, you know, people don't realize how big that is. So, oh man, let let us know, man. What you what you working on, man? What inspired you to write it and what's it about? Well the, the title of the book is called The Millennial Mindset. And the reason why I came up with that title is because we're living in a, a time that's changing. You know, the, the dating game is changing, how we view men and women are changing, how the educational system is changing or failing, if you will. And 
I feel like that a lot of the things that this new generation and my current generation are going through is borderline obsolete. And I feel that, you know, we need to give our future generation that raw game that they need to be able to play this game that we call life. And I honestly feel that we are misinformed. Now, the, the purpose of why I wrote this book in the first place is because I graduated college with my bachelor's degree in environmental management at the age of 27. And I believe to a certain degree that college is a scam. Mm. Now I know that <laughs> mm. Mm. that's gonna be able to catch a lot of fire behind mm. this, but you know, I'm glad I have the opportunity to to spread my viewpoints on the show because I can make my message very clear, especially since I'm writing a book. Mm. And I feel that I'm more qualified to write the book because I went through the system of college, but I played the game a different way. And one of the topics that I have is called the draft theory. And the draft theory is based around the NFL, reason being is because a lot of, you know, just a casual watcher just like sports and a lot of people understand the draft theory. And a little uh, thesis of, my, of the draft theory, it highlights the average college student has a higher opportunity of landing their career field than the average doctor, lawyer, physician, construction worker, etc. Reason being is because they have a system in place called the draft that will allow players to work in their actual profession. And the question I've always wondered within these last couple of years is how come these other professions don't have a draft system? And what I mean by draft system, if, if I've got a 4.0, 3.7 GPA, where are all of these organizations, these companies, looking for our talent? How, how come, how come um, Microsoft, Apple, uh, IBM, these different facilitators that look for all this talent, how come they're not recruiting outside these colleges? And when you graduate as a college student, you don't, there's really no incentive for graduating. And what I realized is the only thing that's guaranteed out of college is debt. Mm. That's the only thing that's guaranteed is debt. Now, why why my situation, why me, why am I so different? I went to school online. You know, I told I told my mom I didn't want to go to a university. I told my mom I just wanted to party. <laughs> so much so that I like, you know, don't waste your money on me. You know, I, I know I'm gonna act up. I know I'm not serious, so let me find my own way. And so I went to community college. I was able to get my financial aid. I took that financial aid money so I could buy my first, well, I won't say my first car, but buy a car or handle certain expenses that I need the money for. And I was able to get through my associate's degree with no problem. Now, I was working two jobs with my associate's degree and I couldn't land a job. I was very, very discouraged. I, I wanted to, to, to give up. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to quit school altogether, go back to school. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I, t I told my mom that hey, I want to go back to school, but this time I'm, I'm going to do things differently. And I told her, and this is going to be a quote in the book: is, you know, I'm not going to work. I'm, I'm not going to work for school. School's going to work for me. And I carried that mindset throughout my whole college career for my bachelor's, because. School had to meet a certain demand and criteria that I had set for myself in order for me to go back. Uh, one was I had to be able to go to school online. Reason being is because I was able to work during college and still make money. It has to be affordable to where I can pay out of pocket to afford school. Because you know how the old saying goes, if you can't afford it, you shouldn't have it in the first place. Same thing with my education. And and the, when I stuck with that, I was able to work my full-time job. I was able to complete college, and I completed school with zero student loan debt. Mm. And that, and a lot of people didn't understand that. You know, because I, I didn't understand that, because I spoke to a lot of my friends who were the same age as me, who are gonna be graduating seniors. They have 20, they have 22, to sixty thousand dollars worth of debt so you know i wanted to create that for them 
another topic I have is called you know Daddy's Little Girl, and I don't, I don't think I have enough time to, to cover that, but this one's going to be a very special piece to me because it's more of a story. It's the the basis of the story is about uh, a father sending his daughter off to college, and little does he know he's, he's sending her off to a plantation because that's what we do to our children. You know, no different than a slave master. And it's kind of confusing, but I'll break it down as simple because I'm going to expand that more in the story. What we tell, traditionally as a parent, we tell our, our children to go to school, get good grades, go find a job. That's no different than us giving our, you know, grooming our children for an arranged marriage with a corporation or business that don't care nothing about us. You know, we, we tend to make our children the, the best and brightest student and we, we ship them away. It's like, it's like when we tell them, go work for Apple, go be a, lock, a, a doctor, go be a lawyer and send them to these white companies. It's like we're, we're sending them away on a slave ship and those, they never come back to the community and start building here back at home. Right. We, we groom our children to give these corporations a multi-million dollars and once they get old, they can't come back and give mama and papa a job. They can't get their brother a job. They have no stock to invest in the company. They, they, they can't, they don't even, we don't have pensions anymore. We can't even retire anymore. So what are you working for? And, and you know, if only daddy would have known what he set his daughter up for, maybe there could have been a better way. So I want to talk about that story. And the last thing I want to talk about is you know, um, when you go into the job interviews, they talk about you don't have enough experience. That's you know that's my that's my favorite topic because you know everybody I speak to after graduation, like oh man, I don't have enough experience. I don't have enough experience. I'm going to tell you why you don't have enough experience. It's because you do not speak the same language as your employer. Mm. Most 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 people that build these companies, they never went to college. They, they never had to go through the traditional curriculum. So when you have somebody that hasn't went through those same, the same road as you have, do you, how, how can you relate? How can you have that same conversation? Now, if you have a young man or a young woman that was you know, mopping floors, sweeping, you know, building up to that position, and once it's time to get to the interviewing process, you know, the interview will be like, oh man, I remember when I was young, I used to, you know, I used to, you know, sweet floors, I used to be able to try to work my way up into management, and they see that, so it's really a language barrier. It, it really is a language barrier when it comes to trying to get the interviews. Mm. And uh, one more thing I would like to share is, these colleges promise us, allegedly, if you have a bachelor's, you're supposed to make X amount of money. If you have a master's degree, you're gonna get X amount of dollars. The number one question is, who said that? Because when you apply to these companies, they can't afford to pay you that type of money. It's right. not in their budget usually. So, so who had that that conference or that agreement about how much a person should make after they graduate from that profession? That's that's all the college. Apple didn't say I was going to pay you thirty five dollars an hour. Right. Right. <laughs> you know? I, I, it's, uh, yeah. And and actually, you know, with with certain um, colleges, you know, particularly like the smaller ones, you have people actually trying to sue. Um, you know, the school is saying that y'all made us false promises on, you know, what would happen after graduation. Um, and yeah, man, like I, I, I can't wait for the for the book, man, because there's, there's so many valid points, you know, that me and you even talk on, on, you know, just me, even though, you know, we may laugh and make jokes about the Hispanics and, you know, saying them being 20, 30 in the house and everything else like that. You know, I've always said that. Um, you know, um, our, our people are kind of the only ones that tell our children, hey, at 18, you're grown, go on, get it on your own. And without giving them necessary tools, um, you know, some some of those other um, cultures are able to actually give their kids um, pensions and things like that that they've had since they were babies that, hey, to graduate college, hey, here's 20, 30,000, you know what I'm saying, to start your life. And right. hey, you know what I'm saying, go home. Or, hey, you could stay at home with us and, we keep all this money in the house until you're ready to step out into the world on your own. And, you know, also the point that you brought up on us sending our kids away, um, you know, as we run out of time, um, I'm, I'm thinking about um, 
you know, something from Carter D. Woodson and the Miseducation of the Negro, where he said, you know, back in the 1930s, like, it does us as a community no better to have more college education, co more college educated people, and those people are going to leave the community and use their talents, you know, and not bring them back. Right. You know, right. we just keep, um, this is back in the 1930s. I remember him saying this, you know, because we, we had a significant more black people earning degrees from the 1800s. But he, like, said, hey, what does this mean if we're giving all these black people degrees and they're using it to go out and help every other community but their own? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's just kind of one thing that you see that continues the cycle that, you know, we have on, you know, our biggest and our brightest, you know what I'm saying, not actually being active and helping pull those up from the bottom, man. So, man, I, I look forward to it, man. When you think you're going to be done with the book, man? Uh, I would say this book will probably take me a couple of years okay. to do. reason being is because I, I want to be, I, I want to have extensive research. I want to have my sources correct. I want to have different links and different, different things to where people can access the information. You know, um, actually, it's funny that you say that because I had a, a college student read my draft theory, and he told me that, that it's, it's, it's too... It's too in depth. He said, "Kids, man, I want to read it." Yeah. And I told him, "I said, well, you're in college, right? You supposed to want to have higher. You you here for higher learning, right? You know, reading this can't be no worse than reading Shakespeare, anything else you've been reading. Yeah. So, you know, I want to make sure that my my content is, you know, relevant, is current, and is really speaking to the voices of, you know, of children and adults who don't know what's going on out here because it is possible." Man, most definitely, most definitely. Man. Well, I, I appreciate you coming. Tim Oh, okay. Well, hey, man, we get we get Tim Oh, okay. So, oh, we got we got a little, so we got a little time because it, it is some things I wanted to share. Oh, also, yeah. in regards to the to the topic, you know, my my parents they told me there would be two things that I would have that would be the two most important expenses I would have in life, which would be buying my first house and buying a car. But my parents never told me that one of the biggest investments I'll ever make is signing that dotted line for a student loan. And that's very, very important because when you think about it, you know, what age do these marketers start tar targeting our children with credit cards? Absolutely, teenagers. Teenagers Absolutely. around, no, no yeah. later than 15, sometimes 16. Absolutely. And what, what, does, what do they say? Oh, you, you got a credit card, it has a $5,000 credit limit. And to a 16 year old, that's like $5,000 worth of Jordans. Right. So you thinking that, you know, I can right. buy whatever, whatever I want, but nobody told you about the interest. Right. I'm going to tell you, it's an 85% interest rate. It's an 85% interest rate. Interest rate. <laughs> you have to make payments. You have to do this. You have to do that. And, you know, being as an adult, paying bills is hard. Right. It's hard to, you know, when you're dealing with your credit, you know, to try to maintain your bills and juggle different things. And, you know, when you're a teenager, you get your home, your hormones are changing. You got bills, you got girlfriends, you got graduation, you got prom, you got part, you got a million different things you want to worry about, or worry about besides paying bills. So, you know, I say that to say this, you know, you want to be mindful of signing that dotted line because you, you're causing your children to play a grown man's game, a grown woman's game that they're not ready for Absolutely. because they don't really understand. Absolutely. Yeah, they, yeah. I mean, even when you talk about, you know, saying the whole game in itself, of, you know, saying just as a person that, you know, saying works in the college. I mean, even when you look at the whole concept of student loan, it isn't really any money until you pay it back. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's all, <laughs> it's all ones and zeros and electronic currency that you've agreed to or, or any of any of these loans are um you know now you know all these stores have a thing where they'll do in-store credit and everything else like that and you'll sign up for this card and, and use it and it won't really be any money until you start paying it back with interest um you know you won't even you won't even think about it that way like you said you're just thinking like hey you know say here's the opportunity to get more more stuff you know, so that, 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 you know that you may not necessarily need, because uh, of course, you know, if you're uh, below a certain income level, you know, what I'm saying like they aren't giving you a lot of credit anyway. So oh no, now, they go, yeah, they definitely aren't going to give you a whole lot of credit. But you know, also got to be mindful of that too is you know a lot of you know those student loans don't really start hitting you until you're either drop out of college or you graduate, and. 
I said this previously that the only thing that's guaranteed is debt when you're dealing with college. But you also want to be mindful because nobody guarantees you a job neither. Right. I know a lot of college graduates who didn't get their big break maybe two, three years after they graduated. Well, look, you already two, three years behind the curve. Right. If you want to talk about buying a house, you already negative 60000 through student loans. Now you got a car note. Right. You behind, you, you, you bought a brand new car, that's $20,000. Right. Absolutely. You $80,000 negative. Right. So when, when you want to try to buy a house, the bank is going to ask you how many years you've been in your profession. They'll ask you what kind of job you are with, how many years in your profession. That's, that's one of the words to, one of the key words to kind of separate you to deny you for a house. Right. Then they're going to ask you for your credit score. Will you build a credit score? Were you building your credit during college or were you accumulating debt during college? Mm -hmm. So once you graduate, you $80,000 in a hole, you have zero established credit, apartment complex won't take you because you don't have enough credit, you're going back home to your mama anyway. Right, right. So you got to ask yourself, was all that partying really worth it? At the end of the day, we don't have nothing to show for it. Absolutely. And you definitely, you know, just have to be mindful of, you know what I'm saying, all the things that you mentioned. Because, you know, me personally, um, you know, when I when I talk to kids, um, you know, a lot of people spread the message of, like you say, everybody needs to go to college. And, you know, I, I don't believe that. I believe that um, it comes a certain age, you know, in a teenager's life to where we have to reach them and we have to ask them what do they want to do. And then, you know, once they figure out what they want to do, then at that point, we'll be able to help formulate a plan on what's actually necessary, needed in order for you to get into the profession. Um, yeah, you know, you're talking about being a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. It definitely, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you, you know what I'm saying? You're definitely going to have to go through um, schooling. But, you know, if you, you know, you're good with your hands and you want to be an electrician or something else like that, um, you know, you may, you may look to a vocational school. Or because, you know, I believe that everybody definitely, um, because of the inadequacies in our public education system, everybody needs some form of um, training after um, high school. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that you have to go to a four-year college or, you know, a major university or a private school or anything else like that, uh, thinking that you're going to get a better education. Now, you know what I'm saying, you're just going to have a, have a better brand you know what I'm saying, on your degree. It's like your Jordans versus Reeboks, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're all still shoes, but, you know what I'm saying, some people like the prestige of, you know, certain schools. But, you know, you definitely have to be smart um, with the um, with anything that people are giving you, um, you know, because, like you said, they're, they're going to give you the tool and not tell you how to use it, you know what I'm saying? Right, so, right. you know, that's the reason why a lot of people end up taking out a lot more student loans than they actually needed for school. You know what I'm saying? And like I said, that's just the game that we, we definitely have to make sure that we let our kids know, man. You got one more thing to say, man, for we got to hear right? Yeah, you know, I want to add on to that. You know, you know, by any means, I'm not saying that, you know, don't 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 send your kids to college. It's bad. It's, it's not about that. It's really about being strategic in how you go about navigating through the system because don't get me wrong, I, I've always thought that school wasn't for me until I actually tried it. And I was actually good for it. I was actually good at college. You know, you can be successful without going to college. You know, my thing is if you don't have a game plan, if you choose not to go to college, then you'll be in trouble. No different if you go to college and you pick a career, you try to look for some moon rocks and you want somebody to hire you, you know, expect the consequences of not maybe land that career that you do. Right. But if you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist, things that require you to have that piece of paper, that makes the most sense. But if you want to be like in, if you want to start your own business, you really don't need a degree to start your own business. You know, I, I see Mexicans with taco trucks every corner. Oh no, we live in Texas, on every block you see a taco truck and they don't even speak English. So I know they didn't go to, you know, they didn't go to college. to in houses and everything. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you can't hate it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can't hate it at all. You got can't hate it, get educated. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes, sir. That's it, man. And so, man, on, on this second day, man, of Kuji Chagalia, man, self-determination, man, just make sure that we're practicing Kuji Chagalia 365, man. We're defining ourselves, naming for ourselves, creating for ourselves, and speaking for ourselves.
Man, um, it's your brother Atu Rob, man. I want to thank the Bridge of Light Radio Network again for allowing us to be here today. Man, it's a blessing. Um, I didn't expect this when I woke up. But, you know, anytime it's E, get a call, you know what I'm saying? You got to come through, you know what I'm saying? I got to come through and I got to support. And I want to make sure that everybody that follow me, you know what I'm saying, supports, you know what I'm saying, this wonderful station. And, you know what I'm saying, I ain't going to let the cat out of the bag. But we got some more things coming for 2018, you know what I'm saying? We talking about Melanated, Illuminated, Bridge Light, you know what I'm saying? Combination, you know what I'm saying? We, we getting on it, but... You know what I'm saying? Like I said, I ain't going to give them too much. You know what I'm saying? We just going to go hit them over the head. You know what I'm saying? In 2018. Um, like I said, um, uh, peace and blessings to everybody, man. Um, I hope that you have a wonderful remaining last few days of the year. And may your 2018 be prosperous. Peace. We out. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.